Story five of Kafer Kangaroo Klondike Tales of the Gold Fields by Thaddeus William Henry Levitt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story five The Garden Gully Mine. You ken Bendigo, said my companion, looking out of the corner of his eye at the bottle sitting on the table before us right well i answered we had dropped in at the criterion swanson street melbourne for an evening well continued sandy mcleod it's a long time agone but i'll never forget it forget what the garden gully did you ever hear the story now i'm a new chum as you know i poured out a glass of fallon sparkling at the sight sandy smacked his lips sandy was a colonial solicitor and apparently an unprofitable mind to work for a story so i bided my time the glass of wine began to mellow his heart for he abruptly exclaimed men on goldfields are crazed with greed but a good-looking woman sends them stark mad even i sandy mcleod was once mad it was only a passing craze i suggested not a bit of it mad for months mad when awake and doubly mad when asleep what cured you a nip of the same dog and then he burst into a laugh one more glass and then i will tell you the story settling back in his chair he began in a voice mellower than i dreamed that he possessed teddy o'flynn yes o'flynn with a big o as he used to say had a little cabin on the bendigo field and behind the cabin was a little garden in the gully it was the only garden on bendigo at that time and we all knew it to a man no deep shafts then only a spade a pick and a tin dish and thirty thousand miners on the field that garden grew roses and english roses too at that i can see them now and it's near on fifty years ago they whispered to every man jack of us of home dear home when we went up there and leaned on the palings of a sunday back we were in our native villages teddy o'flynn was not the man to cultivate roses save the ones which blossomed on his nose and they were always in full bloom teddy had a foster daughter the queen rose of bendigo and as the roses bloomed so bloomed rosa for that was her name while the roses were in bloom on saturday afternoon rosa made a round of the camp she never sold the roses but she made each miner a present of one and the miners not to be outdone made her a present of a pinch of gold she had to pinch it herself between her rosy little finger and thumb rosa took up the camp in a regular way so that in time we all got a rose and were satisfied teddy o'flynn had never studied books and yet he was a bit of a philosopher and an irish philosopher at that teddy never worked and yet he ate and drank of the best on bendigo perhaps the pinches which rosa made had something to do with teddy's good fortune the miners were content teddy was happy and rosa well the whole camp was in love with her and you fell in love with her too i ventured to remark i never denied it at that time there were but two lawyers on the field phelan shea and sandy mcleod that's myself part of the time we dug on the lead for we both held claims but when a dispute arose phelan was retained by one client and mcleod by the other then we fought it out before the gold commissioner and honors were generally equally divided the shamrock and the scotch thistle they used to call us the best of friends we were though we often nearly came to blows rosa distinguished us from the other miners by calling us gentlemen phelan and i were regarded as the favored suitors but that did not prevent the other men from striving to secure such a valuable claim one evening i was at o'flynn's cabin and the next night phelan was at the same place and basking in the same smiles to all of our vows rosa returned the same answer what would become of teddy o'flynn if i married we each promised to allow teddy a pension for life rosa well knew that phelan and i could not scrape up a hundred pounds but like all miners we were willing to bank on the future for any number of thousands rosa was most impartial and fed each one on the same manna 
our infatuation increased month by month and when the rainy season came on and no roses remained teddy proved equal to the occasion and regularly borrowed half a sovereign from each when we called at the cabin phalen may have lent the money out of sheer irish good will but i know that sandy mcleod in his heart regarded him teddy as a golden fleece how the contest would have ended i cannot say but unfortunately teddy suddenly conceived the idea of becoming rich that decided our fate his plan was to sink a shaft in the garden in the gully and open up a gold mine naturally we expected that rosa would protest but on the contrary she declared that the plan originated with her own sweet self she had dreamed that there was an immense deposit of gold hidden away beneath the english roses teddy had only to dig and he would find the treasure but no person was to assist him and the work must be done at night only phalen and myself were taken into the secret teddy went to work and day after day poured into our ears the history of his progress as the garden lay far removed from the bendigo lead and no indications existed that gold would be found in our hearts we secretly felt that it was a clever device upon the part of rosa to keep her foster parent out of the public and at the same time set him to work the mining had been going on for about three weeks when one afternoon phalen and i each received a note from rosa asking us to call that evening at the cabin we were punctual to the minute but each was somewhat crestfallen on discovering the presence of his rival teddy o'flynn was laboring under an excitement which he in vain attempted to conceal after a substantial supper and a glass of hot toddy rosa drew the curtain of the four-pane window and then told us the story teddy had struck upon one of the richest leads ever found on bendigo the earth was literally packed with gold then teddy took up the running i tell yous i've struck it we both grasped him by the hand for teddy had suddenly become an important factor a factor we instantly saw must be counted upon and conciliated rosa was now heiress it might be to millions not that we loved her any more ardently that was impossible but fortune had suddenly turned the wheel and we keenly felt the change all we could say to teddy was rich rich just loaded down with the yellow beauty he exclaimed come down and see the jade she's led me many a fine caper from the old sod up here among the kangaroos and the wallaby and the bears with no tails and the dirty haythen neggers but i've got her down in the gully and it will be sailing away to the blessed shores of st patrick that teddy o'flynn will be with a mighty big o come with me this blessed minute we hurried down to the gully once on the spot we saw that teddy was original in his mining he had cut a series of short trenches which grew deeper and finally terminated in an irregular hole into which we all crowded though unable to stand upright so low was the pit teddy lit a candle and pointing to the pick said to phalen dig dig then he gave me the shovel the ground was very hard of a dull yellow color and interspersed with small gray broken quartz crystals we filled a wash tub which teddy deftly lifted to his head and balanced with his hands then marched out and up to the cabin in the kitchen we began to pan out the contents of the tub with the aid of some water and a tin wash dish teddy stood aloof leaving phalen and mcleod to do the work the earth was literally full of coarse gold in all of our experience at ballarat and bendigo we had never seen its equal i want you gentlemen to float a company said o'flynn what shall we call it the st patrick no said rosa i dreamed it out and i must name it what shall it be call it the garden gully then and there it was christened and baptized in the wash tub how much shall we float it for inquired phalen fifty thousand pounds at a pound a share give all the boys a chance the following morning the notice was on the door of the commissioner's office and within two hours every rod of land for half a mile on each side of the cabin had been staked out 
the camp went mad hundreds of good claims were abandoned and as promptly jumped by the unlucky before the sun went down phalin and i had more cases than had ever fallen to us before in our lives when questioned about the garden gully we related the story of the wash tub that day every share was sold and half a crown paid down for two days it was almost impossible to get near the cabin the earth swarmed with miners but not a speck of gold was found on the morning of the third day phalin and i found our huts besieged by an angry mob during the excitement teddy had been transformed into teddy o'flynn esq a personage who held high carnival at the golden fleece and who during that time had ordered and helped drink one hundred bottles of champagne at twenty dollars a bottle the situation was serious phalin and i were marched up to the golden fleece where o'flynn was secured and the trio followed by thousands proceeded to the garden gully where rosa was mounting guard over the entrance to the mine she was armed with an antiquated musket and resolutely kept the men at bay a fierce light burned in her blue eyes which enhanced her beauty a thousandfold at our suggestion two miners were let into the pit to secure some wash dirt our lives hung upon the issue if the miners did not find gold our fate was sealed phalin mcleod and teddy would dangle from the limb of the nearest gum tree within ten minutes the dirt was brought out and panned off in the presence of the mob i shall never forget the silence which fell upon the men till my dying day when the miner turned and flashed the gold in the pan in our faces a cheer for o'flynn broke forth and such cheers as bendigo had never heard before the very hills rang again and again rosa was the heroine of the hour dirty and greasy miners clasped her in their arms and kissed her with frantic joy o'flynn and his solicitors were escorted in a triumphal march back to the golden fleece where teddy made a speech and shouted for all who cared to drink in the confusion phalin and i made our escape the next day shares in the garden gully advanced to two pounds each a week later the mine was turned over to the shareholders and work commenced teddy o'flynn was entertained that night at a banquet at which it was declared that he was the gold king of the land of the southern cross at midnight teddy sank a limp mass under the table and was carried to bed with the honors of a dead pharaoh for a few hours the garden gully realized the wildest dreams and then just as suddenly stopped not even the color could be found shares dropped to a shilling and no takers the gold commissioner ordered an investigation during the inquiry it was clearly shown that the mine had been salted the plan had been to first dig the hole and then charge a gun with powder and coarse gold and fire it into the earth rosa who was innocent of the fraud testified that at night she had heard many shots and that o'flynn had explained that he had been shooting at the kangaroos which came to gnaw the rose bushes when confronted by the evidence o'flynn refused to confess maintaining a dogged silence save that if the mine was salted rosa and his solicitors were innocent the money received was returned to the shareholders except a few hundred pounds which o'flynn had squandered o'flynn was committed to stand his trial the following night phalin and i repaired to the little cabin where much to our surprise we found rosa apparently in the best of spirits when we asked her for an explanation she said i tell you there is plenty of gold in the garden gully and it was not put there by teddy o'flynn i saw it again last night in my dreams it is down deeper and runs away out there pointing toward the range will you dig for it or shall i do the work myself we suggested hiring two miners no she said with a toss of her pretty head it must be found without any outside help and teddy set free instantly we both agreed with her we would have agreed to any proposition falling from the same lips without a moment's delay she produced two miners caps into the peaks of which she thrust two candles then marched us out to the pit 
the candles were lighted rosa took a seat on the tub we seized the pick and shovel and began to dig rosa chatted and laughed the hours flew by at midnight she brought us a lunch and two bottles of ale but it was not until near dawn that our taskmaster called a halt rosa explained that during the day she would wash some of the dirt and report the result the next night worn out and completely exhausted phalin and i staggered to our huts not a word was exchanged as we stumbled down the path our hands were covered with blisters our clothes bedaubed with yellow clay our faces streaked and seared with soot and grease from the dripping candles two such melancholy objects could not be found in all bendigo each was determined not to yield it was a contest of scotch grit and irish pluck all day long we slept or nursed our lacerated hands each recuperating for the second struggle we were animated by no hope that gold would be found a more powerful influence was at work and bade us continue the struggle at night we were again at the cabin rosa reported no gold then we renewed our labors with the same hardships and the same results for eight nights in succession the struggle went on our legal business went by the board rumors said we were drinking ourselves to death and appearances confirmed the rumor on the ninth night imagine our surprise when rosa informed us that we had struck the lead and in proof exhibited fully an ounce of the yellow metal no miner ever gazed upon a great nugget which he had found with joy equal to ours it was a drawn battle when will it end was the query in our minds rosa gave no sign but served an excellent supper prepared to celebrate our success it was then arranged that rosa was to pay the gold commissioner a visit the following morning and inform him that the lead had again been found in the garden gully and that consequently teddy o'flynn had committed no fraud and should be released our offices was open that day but no attention was paid to our reformation so great was the excitement an investigation of the mine proved the truth of rosa's statement once more the tide turned in favor of teddy o'flynn and for the second time he became the gold king of bendigo teddy had sold the garden gully for a rich mine and it was rich the shareholders demanded the return of their stock paid in their money and gave teddy a second banquet at the golden fleece with the same results save that teddy went under the table at ten thirty instead of at twelve a weakness attributed to his confinement in the caboose and consequently condoned by his friends three days later phalin and sandy mcleod each received a note from rosa requesting them to be present at the cabin at eight p m and also stating in postscript that it was an important occasion therefore we were to be dressed in our best phalin inferred from the word important that he was the lucky man while i drew the same inference from the same word walking on the air for our happiness made us oblivious of bendigo its dust and its wretchedness we approached the cabin at the same time punctual to a minute we passed compliments of the day and then surveyed each other phalin was dressed in a pair of black trousers a white shirt and a collar a yellow vest but no coat sandy boasted an antediluvian dress coat blue trousers and a red shirt we were met at the door by rosa clad in a white muslin gown with a great bunch of roses at her belt i had never seen her look lovelier so great was my happiness at securing the prize that the words died on my lips phalin was equally overcome and for precisely the same reasons teddy received us with genuine irish hospitality and a glass of whisky entering the cabin we were face to face with a young english curate who had been sent up from melbourne as a missionary it was evident that the hour had come we were confronted by our destiny the curate remarked in a languid drawl this is a happy occasion rosa smiled her sweetest then she went out to the kitchen and came back blushing and leaning on the arm of dennis mccarthy a young irish miner my dear friend she said 
I have bid you to my wedding. Dennis is the lucky man. We pledged our troth in dear old Carey. The ceremony proceeded, and each kissed the bride. It was the first and last time. How we spent the next hour I shall never know, and Phelan can furnish you with no fuller particulars. I have a confused recollection of Rosa, the curate, Teddy, a bunch of roses, and McCarthy, that is all. At last we got away, heaven only knows what we said. Once out on the path, we stalked along in moody silence. When we came to the Golden Fleece, we each turned in, entered the private parlor, and ordered whiskey straight. Two hours later we were sent home by the landlord in Barrows. When I awoke the next morning, I found myself in Phelan's hut and in Phelan's bed. Phelan found himself in my hut and in my bed. How the thing happened we have never been able to explain. The following day, when we met, we concluded to enter into partnership, and the sign reads to this day, Shea and MacLeod Solicitors. No, we have never married. What about the Garden Gully? The mine is running yet, and has paid the shareholders many handsome dividends. Rosa? The day following the wedding, the bride, McCarthy, and Teddy took a special stage for Melbourne en route for the old sod. A week later, my partner and I each received a letter, precisely the same, written in Rosa's best hand, containing a certified check on the Bank of Australia, drawn in our favor, for five hundred pounds. End of story five. Story six of Kafer Kangaroo Klondike Tales of the Gold Fields by Thaddeus William Henry Levitt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story six The Green Door A Night in Melbourne. A winter night in Melbourne. It had been raining all day, the wind from the south blew chill and raw. As I wandered down Great Burke Street, I saw, drawn up in a line, some fifty men standing in the gutter. Each man had his eyes fastened on a green baize door directly in front of them, as if their last hope depended upon its opening. The men were of all sorts and conditions, the sundowner from the back blocks, the costermonger without a barrow, the new chum who had deposited with his gracious uncle, the professional free lunch rounder, and the decayed gentleman. One wretched creature in particular drew my attention. At one time, some time, heaven knows how long distant, he had been a gentleman. The fragments of a Prince Albert coat were buttoned tightly up to his very chin. I should have said pinned, for every button was gone. His hands, blue with the cold, were clean, and there was something in his very attitude which said, I am not to this manner born. I beckoned to him, and when he came up I said, Come with me, my friend. He followed at my side, but spoke not a word. Entering a private room in the coffee-house, I called for a glass of hot beef tea. While he was drinking the tea greedily, but shivering between each gulp, I ordered a hot dinner. He ate the dinner with the voracity of a starving man. Then I handed him a cigar. I closely watched him and saw, written on his face, an unsatisfied longing. "'What is it?' I said." opium came in a hoarse tremolo from his throat i have it i said drawing a half ounce bottle of laudanum from my pocket i had purchased it for a prospective trip quick six glasses he whispered the waiter brought the glasses my strange companion placed them in a line and then said divide it into six parts pointing to the laudanum i complied with his request he seized the first glass, drained it, and closed his eyes. Taking up the herald, I waited. After the lapse of five minutes, I turned to my guest. His eyes were wide open, almost staring, while the ghost of a smile played around his mobile mouth. "'What is your name?' I asked. "'John Lilburn,' he answered slowly, as if he were struggling to recall his own name. "'Where from?' I queried. "'No reply.' only a puzzled expression on his face. Then he croaked out, 
time for number two immediately he swallowed the contents of the second glass and again closed his eyes this time the interval was not so long a tinge of colour stole into his thin cheeks his hands ceased to tremble the creature began to look like a man how long have i been here he inquired as if surprised at his surroundings and the complacent mood in which he found himself then his eyes fell upon the glasses and he nodded his head as much as to say i see it all now you came with me from in front of the green door i replied what does the green door signify supper he answered supper for all who stand in the line at eight o'clock and are sober a good samaritan on burke street a christian in a new quarter and in a strange guise that depends upon your standpoint of view murmured my companion the man conducts side by side a drinking place and the restaurant in the restaurant every night for half an hour he cares for some of the finished product turned out by his other establishment has he turned you out as finished i never drink he said a trace of hauteur coming into his manner worse said i pointing to the glasses my last remaining friend was his reply and he raised the third glass to his lips and drank it off with the dignity of a gentleman of the old school he brushed back his tangled hair with a nervous energy his very presence grew upon me then he unpinned and threw back his coat exposing his bare chest for he wore no shirt arose and paced the room with a decided step which betokened a man used to command the homeless beggar had vanished and in his stead stood god's noblest work i beg your pardon he said but whom have i the honour of meeting i gave him my name and he bowed with courtly grace we are brothers he said all men are brothers but unfortunately our pride prevents us from acknowledging the truth then we drifted into conversation and i learned that he belonged to an excellent family in the north of ireland he had obtained his degree at trinity college dublin taken orders and proceeded to south australia where the bishop gave him a large parish in the pastoral country suddenly the relator became reticent and relapsed into silence i divined the cause and pointed to the glasses he hesitated and then he drank off another but with the disgust shown when one is compelled to take medicine the effect of this potion was unexpected the parson for such i must call him burst into song at first sentimental and then comic they were certainly not acquired at a divinity school he fairly rollicked in the patter songs so famous years ago in the london music halls when he drew a comparison between a monkey and a dude in which the monkey had the best of it he was irresistible and i laughed till the tears ran down my cheeks the reckless abandon the rollicking gaiety the quip and the quirk all were perfect i forgot who he was and what he was as the last patter song died on his lips he turned ashy pale and began to tremble violently i handed him another glass but he dashed it from my hand and poured out upon me such curses as i had never heard before they froze my blood and gave me a sight of the very soul of the man reeking with blasphemy and hatred and a savage malevolence so vindictive that a fiend from the bottomless pit would have turned and fled as i darted to the door he seized me and with the strength of a madman hurled me into a chair his horrible laugh ringing out with sardonic glee piercing the ears and running into a mocking refrain turning to the table he swallowed all the laudanum which remained two minutes later he was another man his mouth was that of a child with the pathetic pucker always seen before an infant bursts into tears i forgot his violence his obscenity everything in the new character before me i felt that the curtain was up for the last act when it fell there would be darkness the light would fail and the green door come back i have never told the story he exclaimed but the time has come when it must be told 
His voice was so low that I was compelled to bend forward and listen as the words fell from his lips. Then he dashed into the recital, startling in its intensity. In my parish was one great squatter who made his home upon the estate, the other squatters living in Adelaide or Melbourne. John Bond held by the good old English practice and lived upon his estate. If the land did so much for him, he said, then he was bound to stand by the land. At my first visit I fell in love with John Bond's daughter, Helen. Up to that moment I had been bound up in the work of the church. Men called me an enthusiast, a dreamer. I believed and acted upon my belief. I know that I had a mission, tidings to impart, hope and comfort to offer. I was a priest, consecrated to the work, not an interpreter. I believed that a priest should not marry. Twenty-four hours spent at John Bond's house made me a new man. I looked back on the past as a dream. I saw myself a phantom, a church instrument, but for the first time I felt myself a man. I had been a slave. I became a living fire. I had dreamed of happiness for mankind. Mankind were swallowed up in Helen Bond. She constituted the universe, my universe. I pouted out my passion and found my love returned. What more could priest or man demand? Half the summer I lived in a dream, an ecstasy, a delirium. I had not saved a sovereign, for my creed was, give all to the poor. That is, it had been my creed before I met Helen. She took absolute possession of my heart, my emotions. My first pang came when my would-be bride told me that the dream of her life had been Melbourne. When we married, there we must live. I implored the Bishop of Adelaide to secure for me a parish in the great metropolis, and received in reply to my letter a curt refusal, with an admonition relative to neglected duties. Helen was adamant the condition was Melbourne. She suggested that I should appeal to her father for assistance, but my pride revolted. At this juncture the news came describing the new gold fields of Western Australia. Helen whispered in my ear, it was but a hint. I caught at it and drove to Adelaide and tendered my resignation. The bishop refused to accept it and told me that I was mad and upbraided me for deserting a sacred cause for mammon. Stung by his reproaches, I confessed my secret. I painted Helen as I saw her, her beauty, grace, sweetness, but nothing moved the ecclesiastic. I flung all to the winds and sailed for Perth on the next steamer. The terrible march to Coolgardie did not abate my ardor. At the mines I was one of the few successful. In four months I wrung out three thousand pounds, but at a fearful cost. The toil, the damp earth, the coarse food and the delirium, which drove me on by day and harassed me by night, sapped the very springs of my life ate up my imagination, devoured my sympathies, obliterated my faith, and planted in their stead a greed for gold behind which I saw the smiling face of Helen. The mail brought me no tidings, though I sent letter after letter down to the coast. Sleep forsook me, I resorted to opiates. My luck deserted me, and this increased my fury. I was soon known as the Mad Miner. I laughed at the taunts, was not a priceless reward before me, Helen ever beckoning me on. I saw her face in every nugget, her form in the little smoke clouds, as they rolled away from the candle in my miner's cap, her smile in the water running over the ripple. I could endure the torment no longer. With my treasure I started for the coast. I watched it by day and slept beside it at night. A thousand times I woke with a horrible start, believing that it was gone. How much opium I used on that journey I shall never know. I landed at Larges Bay and hurried into Adelaide. The green belt which girts the city, the blue sky above, the camellias bursting into bloom, made no appeal to me. 
i had burned up my capacity for enjoyment i was no longer a man but a husk a mere cinder a bit of scoria sucked up by a mighty tempest and driven forward at the bank of australia i drew up and as i did so helen came tripping down the steps and smiling as only helen could smile i rushed forward and caught her in my arms the next instant i was hurled half senseless into the gutter the bishop my bishop stood towering over me in a rage how dare you sir how dare you affront my wife in such a manner you hare-brained he exclaimed he raised his hand to strike me but helen interposed your grace my dear forgive him we both know that he is not always responsible for his actions then they entered a carriage and drove away when i turned i saw my box of gold how i cursed it once to-night i saw it again pardon me if i shocked you the box lies in the bank vaults at adelaide it has been there for five years i shall never touch it again never never how have i lived as the birds live on the crumbs i have begged the opium fiend has me you know it sir but here take this and he thrust into my hand a sealed paper he lived for a week after i went out daily to see him at the alfred hospital st kilda road the lilburn wing of the new adelaide hospital was built with the treasure and the lord bishop delivered a most eloquent address upon the occasion of the laying of the cornerstone but that was many years before the present bishop arrived in the colony End of story six. Story 7 of Kafer Kangaroo Klondike Tales of the Gold Fields by Thaddeus William Henry Levitt. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story 7 The Three Great Pearls, a New Guinea Story. In the Queensland National Club, Brisbane, I made the acquaintance of an Englishman, Leonard Chapman, who fascinated me i can describe the charm of his manner his fund of information and the originality of his conversation in no other terms he had travelled extensively and possessed a thorough knowledge of the south pacific chapman was not over thirty-five years of age he spent his money with a lavish hand even for that lavish country and i learned from some of his acquaintances that he paid brisbane an annual visit and that he was engaged in pearl fishing in torres straits off the north coast of queensland no one appeared to know the precise locality his appearance was striking in the extreme no taint of the beachcomber hung about the man on the contrary he reminded me of a college professor out for a holiday his fund of anecdotes was unlimited yet he was as modest and unassuming as he was undoubtedly brilliant from the tenor of his conversation i gathered that he took a special interest in scientific discoveries and inventions and i soon learned that he had not only read of the nineteenth-century marvels but possessed a thorough knowledge of the means by which they were wrought i inclined to the opinion that he had devoted many years to the study of chemistry but he was equally conversant with the principles of electricity and of molecular research so varied were his gifts and so accurate his knowledge combined with originality that i marvelled he should bury himself on an island in a half-known sea for i gathered that his was an island home so startling were his views relative to changes to come in the near future that there were times when i sat spellbound he held that science would extract nitrogen from the air by a simple and inexpensive process enabling man to increase a thousandfold the fertility of the earth in one of his conversations he said from that hour man will no longer toil for his daily bread now he is groveling in the earth then he will be a giant with nature as his handmaid by artificial processes we shall produce gold and silver and all the precious stones we shall in a few hours from the elements bring forth pearls and all the most prized and beautiful things which nature has provided it was never intended that we should dig and delve for these things 
they were provided as samples as illustrations nature turned them out of her laboratory in the twinkling of an eye and man can do the same if he is guided by her hints the water-wheel the steam-engine and the electrical engine are but the implements of a savage they will disappear the moment we have cast off our swaddling clothes the motive power of the future will be the sun's rays tens of millions of tons of energy but another name for force are daily going to waste on the earth's surface while the blind toil with pick and shovel and plough the air was intended for navigation not the water we shall not be mere copyists but shall improve upon nature she only produces the bitter plum orange and grape it remains for man to render them sweet and luscious the same principle applies not only to the fruits and grains but to every created thing then and not till then will life be worth living many of his views were so new and startling that i refrained from stating them and yet they were presented with such an air of plausibility and so buttressed by facts drawn from recent discoveries that no one in the club ventured to dispute them and yet the following day when other men tried to restate them they appeared most visionary i have never been able to decide whether this was due to want of knowledge or to a charm which chapman wove around his hearers from a prospector i learned that several rich quartz claims had been discovered in the north and thither i decided to proceed i secured passage on a coast steamer for port darwin the point where the cable from asia lands on the australian coast arriving at port darwin i made a trip into the interior but found nothing of value at the port i secured a large sailing boat and set out to explore the coast with a plentiful supply of provisions i set sail taking care to skirt the coast as closely as possible i camped at night and on the second day in making a run across a large bay a sudden squall came up prevalent in that latitude the boat was rapidly driven out to sea and the australian coast soon lost sight of the wind increased in fury and i gave myself up for lost night was coming on the haze and spray prevented my seeing a dozen yards in advance i knew that i was rapidly approaching the coast of new guinea and the reputation which the cannibals of that island enjoyed in the southern hemisphere did not add to my peace of mind i heard the breakers roaring and caught sight of the white crests of foam i was powerless to change the course of the boat by a single point i threw off my coat and boots and determined to make a fight for my life suddenly the boat struck broached broadside and rolled over i was seized by the water for a brief moment and then flung upon the beach the warmth of the sand was comforting and worn out as i was i soon fell asleep nor did i awake until the sun was high in the heavens i was in a small bay where the woods came down to the very shore and nothing was visible which would indicate that a white man had ever visited that part of the coast fortunately i was provided with a watertight match safe and i determined to secure some shellfish on the beach and cook them for breakfast i waded into the surf and soon had a supply of pearl oysters which i cooked they were extremely tough and unpalatable but they satisfied my hunger the boat had been washed ashore and was a complete wreck and i was compelled to abandon all hopes of using it again i made my way into the thicket and had proceeded but a few yards when i came upon a small square building made of rough logs there was no window and the massive door was secured by two large padlocks i knew that the structure was the work of a white man but for what purpose it had been built i could not determine it might be a place used for storing provisions by pearl fishers if so i would not die from starvation i tried the door and then attempted to peer between the logs but as the interior was pitch dark all of my efforts were fruitless by climbing an adjacent tree i reached the roof and after an hour's hard work succeeded in removing two logs i saw that the hut only contained machinery i clambered down inside 
there was a small naphtha engine and a network of wires with several other devices the use of which i did not know then i made my way out and as i was replacing the roof i heard a whizzing sound which was followed by a stinging sensation in the leg in which stuck a long bamboo arrow instantly i dived through the opening into the hut there at least i would be safe for a time immediately i heard voices in a language which i did not understand followed by the running of feet i was surrounded and it was but a question of time when i should not only be captured but probably eaten i seized an iron bar and determined to sell my life for its full worth then came a lull were the savages building a fire for the purpose of roasting me out or of cremating me for their next meal half an hour of dread suspense went by followed by a knocking at the door and a voice asked in english hello who are you and what are you doing in there i am a shipwrecked man i have been shot in the leg by the natives and i am hiding in here to save my life the key turned in the lock the door opened and i was face to face with leonard chapman for a moment he did not recognize me so woebegone was i without coat or boots and the blood oozing from the wound in my leg chapman i exclaimed then he recognized me and reached out his hand but not with the cordiality which i had expected i noticed that a look of vexation if not of distrust was written on his face how did it happen he asked in a few hurried words i told him the story it is fortunate that the arrow was not poisoned he said or you would have been booked with a through ticket can you hobble for half a mile or shall i send the natives for a boat i think i can manage it i answered a little way off stood a number of natives with great bushy heads and holding in their hands immense bows and spears made of bamboo your retainers gave me a warm reception i remarked chapman smiled they are not my retainers they are natives who protect my property along the coast and to whom i give a few pounds of tobacco and occasionally a bottle of square gin half a mile brought us to a deep bay a yawl lay near the shore manned by four as villainous-looking malays as i ever set eyes on at a signal from chapman they brought the boat alongside we stepped in and they pulled away the water was shallow and the bottom muddy a third of a mile from shore we came to chapman's home large bamboo poles had been planted in the mud and at a distance of twenty feet above the water other poles had been lashed in a horizontal position thus forming the foundation of the floor of the hut the floor was also of bamboo poles and over it was built a substantial camp thirty feet long and twenty feet wide when we arrived a ladder was let down and up we scrambled this is most extraordinary i said not for new guinea chapman answered let me see the wound fortunately only a flesh wound it will be troublesome for a couple of weeks the only danger is inflammation in this hot climate i have a medicine chest and a lotion which will remove the soreness when the bandage and the lotion had been applied i felt more comfortable why did you build your house on stilts i asked to guard against attack by the natives then they are not to be trusted no i have been attacked three times since i took up my quarters here on the shore one would certainly be murdered the jungle is so thick that they creep up to the door and make a rush and then all is over out here they must come in canoes i keep a watch day and night if they are seen approaching we are prepared by this windlass we draw up the cutter we have an ample supply of ammunition pointing to a heap of stones on the floor they can only climb up by means of a ladder and before they can accomplish that we simply drop a stone through the bottom of their canoes then there is trouble below a few shots from a winchester and the battle is won the natives in the immediate vicinity have learned that i am not to be trifled with and with them i am now at peace the danger lies with the fellows down the coast who come up on expeditions against the other tribes and incidentally take in the white man prospecting for gold is sufficiently hazardous for me and i shall leave the pearl fishing to others i remarked 
when a substantial meal had been served i asked why do you employ malays oh, they are good fighters and the best pearl fishers what did you build the hut in the woods for i inquired when i first came to the coast i had the hut built for the purpose of conducting a series of scientific experiments for several days my leg was so stiff that i could not get out each morning chapman with four of the six malays went off in the cutter and did not return till noon i noticed that only a few pearl oyster shells had been stored in the hut i saw no signs of a diver's apparatus or of the small nets used by the divers to bring up the shells there was an air of constraint upon chapman out of harmony with the man i had known in brisbane the malays did not speak english and even if they had i doubt whether i should have been able to extract any information from them they were devoted to chapman and evidently could be relied upon in an emergency daily when chapman returned i looked at the bottom of the cutter but saw no pearl oysters the fishing must be poor i said one day months are frequently spent in searching for new beds chapman answered do you bring the oysters here when you find them i inquired no the stench would be unbearable we have to let them decay before we can search for the pearls when my leg improved i wondered that i was not invited to accompany my host in his daily trips but he gave no sign a week slipped by and i was beginning to discuss how i was to get away from the perch as i had grown to call it when the natives came down to the shore late in the afternoon and made signs which immediately threw the malays and chapmen into a violent state of excitement rifles were loaded and a plentiful supply of ammunition lowered into the cutter when all was ready chapman turned to me and said don't be alarmed one of my stations is in danger of being looted i must teach these savages the rights of private property i immediately volunteered my service no no was the answer a wounded man would only be in the way you have already paid dearly enough for your visit without getting another taste of bamboo as the cutter drew away i noticed that all the malays had accompanied chapman leaving me to guard the house at one end of the platform on which the house was built rested a medium-sized canoe made from a single log the cutter soon swept around the point and was lost to view i listened attentively for half an hour then there floated across the headland a faint echo of firearms the battle had evidently begun fainter and fainter grew the sounds and after five minutes they died away in the distance i watched for the return of the victors but they never came that night i did not close my eyes but sat peering out upon the sea the following day was full of dread and anxiety every instant i expected to see the canoes of the savages sweep round the point and swoop down upon me several rifles had been left behind these i loaded and made ready for the foe when the second night came i gave myself up as lost it was utterly impossible for me to keep awake at first i only slept a minute or two then suddenly awoke and sprang to my feet i heard the dip of paddles the stealthy creep of naked feet on the platform at my side and saw the gleam of savage eyes nature at last succumbed and i forgot the horrors of the situation when i awoke the sun was creeping up the sea was calm and not a sign of man white black or brown was to be seen the house was the only place of safety and yet such was my anxiety to ascertain the fate of chapman and his companions that it was with the greatest difficulty i restrained myself in going in quest of them on the third day i could endure the suspense no longer i lowered the canoe to the water loaded all the guns took on board the balance of the ammunition and a supply of provisions and sailed away around the point i was not long in suspense in the little bay where i had been washed ashore lay the wreck of the cutter over the gunwale hung the corpse of a malay with a spear run completely through his body whether chapman and the remainder of the party had been killed or had made their escape to the woods i was unable to decide only the dead malay remained the sail and the oars of the cutter were gone 
I paddled to the cutter and listened, not a sound smote my ears save the ripple of the water on the beach. Finally I decided to visit the small house where I had taken refuge from the natives. I crept cautiously through the underbush. The house was standing, but the door had been battered down. The fragments of the engine and other appliances were scattered over the ground. When I retraced my steps to the beach, I noticed on the sand a number of fine copper wires in a tangled mass. Mechanically I stooped down and took one of the wires in my hand. Then I saw that it ran into the bay. All that remains of Chapman's wonderful dreams, I said to myself. The spirit of curiosity, which had been so keen in the past, was aroused. I would ascertain what was at the end of the wire. I brought the canoe around to that point, and, keeping the wire in one hand, gently paddled out. When I reached a point where the water was about four fathoms in depth, I came to a bamboo pole which had been driven into the bottom of the bay. The top of the pole was only a few inches under the surface of the water, and the wire ran up to and over the top. Putting my hand down and grasping the end of the pole, I was surprised to find that a small pulley had been fitted into the top of the pole, through which the wire ran and then dropped perpendicularly. I carefully drew up the wire, and imagined my astonishment when I saw attached to its end an immense pearl oyster. I landed the oyster and broke off the wire, and then returned to the shore. I was very curious to ascertain what the oyster contained, and proceeded to open it, a feat I accomplished with the greatest difficulty. Carefully removing the meat of the oyster, I saw, at a little distance from where the wire entered the shell, a faint blue circle, and in the circle one enormous pearl and three small ones. My heart nearly ceased to beat. The great pearl was pear-shaped, and in beauty of tint and exquisite coloring far exceeded any pearl which I had ever seen. I knew that it was worth a very large sum, but its size was so great that I was unable to estimate its market value. The three small pearls were very fine, but were completely overshadowed by their magnificent sister. In my exultation I forgot the fate of Chapman and my own immediate danger. I hurriedly went ashore, and from the tangle of wire traced another wire, which ran into the water. This wire I followed with the same result it terminated in an oyster. In the second oyster was the same blue ring, in which lay a great black pearl with two small pearls of the same color. These pearls differed from those first found in that they were perfectly round. Again I went ashore, and once more I was rewarded with an immense pearl and two small ones, the largest being the most beautiful in my collection. A careful search proved that all of the remaining wires had been broken, and I was not able to make any other finds. Then a great fear fell upon me. I had intended to return to the perch and wait for a few days, but possessed of the treasures of the deep, I resolved to make my escape. I hoisted the sail and steered south. Five hours out I sighted a steamer, and half an hour later I was on board one of the British India line bound for Brisbane. On my arrival at that port, I immediately communicated with the authorities, and the colonial secretary dispatched a full account of the tragedy to the High Commissioner at Thursday Island. Six months later I read in the Melbourne Argus that the murder of Captain Chapman had been avenged by sending HMS Tiger to New Guinea, where she shelled several native villages and drove the savages into the interior. I kept the finding of the pearls a secret, as the ends of justice would not be aided by making my discovery public. After reflecting upon the facts, I decided that Chapman had discovered a process by which, with the aid of electricity, he had been able to stimulate the growth of pearls to an abnormal size, and also to develop them with greater rapidity than under normal conditions. I recalled his statement at the Queensland Club, and no doubt remained in my mind that he had selected the New Guinea coast as the place where he was least liable to be disturbed by white men, owing to the hostile character of the natives. 
i also found that the scientist had concluded that pearls were formed by some extraneous substance getting inside of the oyster thus setting up an irritation and giving rise to the term the tears of the oyster there was but one market in the world where my three great pearls would find purchasers at their full value and that was london i therefore took passage a few months later on the orient steamer orizaba and a jeweller in regent street paid me a very handsome sum for my find but he informed me that he would willingly have given double the amount if i had been able to produce two that would match an old friend whom i had not seen for years invited me down to his box in the country for a week's shooting one day as we were standing before the crown arms a carriage rolled up to the door i gave a great start leonard chapman hurriedly alighted and went inside who is that man i asked the moment i recovered my voice the young earl he only came into the estate a few months since his life has been quite a romance the black earl his father quarrelled with him some ten years since and turned him out of the hall the trouble arose over the vicar's daughter whom the young man wished to marry for nine years not a word was heard from the son the black earl had lived a fast life but after the quarrel he redoubled his pace and when he died everything was mortgaged to its full value after his death the jews swarmed down like the plagues of egypt three months later the heir suddenly appeared the debts were paid and what is still better he married the girl though it is said he never wrote her a line during his absence i entered the arms and found the earl speaking to a gamekeeper as he turned to leave the room i said permit me to congratulate you mr chapman i feel certain that the natives had turned you over to the great majority he raised his eyeglass and gave me a well-bred stare chapman you say i am the earl of ibster so i am informed but in new guinea you were mr leonard chapman how many cases of mistaken identity are constantly occurring he said the tichburn case being one in point excuse me sir i trust that you will yet be able to find your new guinea friend mr chapman he raised his hat bowed entered the carriage and was driven leisurely away End of story seven. End of Kafer Kangaroo Klondike Tales of the Gold Fields by Thaddeus William Henry Levitt.